should be okay now we're recording hi guys thanks for coming i'm burke franklin my company is businesspowertools.com i started this thing 30 years ago about 30 i don't even know late 88 i was helping a, a guy write a he, he had an, a friend of mine had a deal going with apple computer and at the time the small business administration the sba had done a study of businesses that failed and they found that of, of the businesses that failed, 60% of them had no business plan. So I think Apple knew that. They wanted to see my friend's business plan because they were buying his engineering software. They were buying his company. They just wanted to use his software. And they wanted to be sure he's going to be around, you know, to, to develop it and improve it and certainly support it and all that. And so they wanted to see his business plan. At the time, I didn't know anything about business plans. I'd been working at the Sharper Image Catalog as a copywriter. And I thought of, well, business plan catalog, giant brochure is what this would be to sell the business concept to Apple. So, and I also knew that different people at different levels of the company were going to have, of course, different interests, biases, uh, responsibilities. And so we didn't really know who was going to look at what. So we knew we needed to show everything. And I'd also sold word processors at one point. And the thing I learned about selling word processors is you, you sell one aspect of the word processor to the person who's actually going to use it, so they like it. And they're going to tell their boss they love it, and then you go to their boss. She's, hey, the, the, you know, I was going to say the dog likes the dog food, but that's really one of the one of the things. That's your product market fit. Does the dog like the dog food? The people like the word processor, and so the supervisor would be excited that yay, my people are going to be happy, going to be more productive, and all that. The CFO wants to be sure it's a good deal. So you're pitching them on the financial aspects of it and what the deal is. And of course the CEO, if you get in front of the CEO, just wants to know that their business is gonna make more money, their people are gonna be happy, problems will be reduced, it's a better deal or make more money. So it's like, it's the same product. It's kind of like the five men and the elephant parable. You're touching a different part of the same beast, but you're explaining it differently. And we took it and I looked at this business opportunity that my friend had to pitch the, the engineering software to Apple, kind of, looked at it the same way. So what, what are people at Apple looking for? Well, all the different people are looking for different things. And so the business plan needed to cover all of that. And he got the deal, yay. But, and over the next year, uh, I guess the word got out or something happened or somehow it was just attracting people who had business ideas, some really great business ideas, but their plans, their pitches, everything about them, you know, there was something missing. It was a good thing, but something was, they were lacking something. They weren't getting the traction. They weren't getting the interest of the investment that they were looking for. And in talking to me about it, I somehow could just sort of tell like what it was and I helped them fix it and they got the deals. And about a year into this, I'm thinking if I see one more crappy business plan, I'm gonna, I'm gonna scream. You know, I'm not gonna hurt somebody, but you know, just, you know how you get one. Anyway, so I'm ranting to myself in the shower. If I, uh, you know, what I, I, what I should do is just take all this content I've developed from these guys and put it together, of course, redact anything proprietary and put it into a Word doc that I could just sell as a template and let people do it themselves because you kind of really have to do your own business plan. You could hire somebody to do it for you, but if you're going to do that, you better bring them on the shark tank because if you're standing on that stage in front of the sharks and 8 million people and they ask you, I think most of the questions are pretty predictable and you can't answer it, you know, Mr. Wonderful or Mark Cuban is going to look at you and say, do you have a business plan? Because they know you don't have one because you can't answer the obvious question. So you've really got to understand your numbers. You've got to understand, you know, your market. You've got to understand how your whole thing works together. And ideally you have your whole team on the same page. So ideally you have your people all work together with you to put this plan together. So everybody is on the same page, tells the same story. And I would go so far as when you get into strategic planning in the future is you want to get input from your the low people in the company like i remember talking to my guy we didn't have a shipping doc but the shipping guy you know he had some ideas and i think wow i'm glad i talked to him normally you just dad he's a shipping guy what does he know so but everybody's got some ideas or something to contribute and you want to i think take advantage of that because they all have something interesting to say anyway um I, I'm a big fan of people collaborating on the business plan, not trying to do it all yourself. And I, I worked for companies or, or, and bosses and businesses where the boss had it all in their head. They don't need no stinking business plan. I know what I'm doing. Well, that's great if that's how you want to run your business. But if you want your people to help you and come up with ideas or when they run into opportunities somewhere out in the world, to think, hey, this would be great for us and participate in running, helping you build the business, 
I presume you want to build a business and not just run a, a, a little mom and pop thing. But if you want to include, if you want other people to really help you pull it, then you want to include them in the plan. So that's just one of those things. And what I, the other thing I, I, I get asked a lot is like, what's it going to take? Like, how much work? How long is this going to take to make this thing happen? And I know in, in real estate, they talk about location, location, location. And in when investors look at businesses, they talk about management, management, management. In every success book you'll probably ever read, the one of the things at the top of the list you're going to read is, what does it take to succeed in business, really anything? And that's persistence, persistence, persistence. And it, my favorite example of that is Walt Disney. Walt Disney pitched Disneyland. Anybody know how many times he pitched Disneyland to get the investment he needed to build it? 600 times. Pitched that thing 600 times. Colonel Sanders started at 65 years old on his Social Security uh, income. And he went out and he pitched Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC now, 1100 and what, 1117 times before someone said, okay, come on in, we're going to, we're going to give this restaurant to you and you're going to cook chicken. <laughs> you know, I can't, I just, I can't, I would have given up. I don't know how many times I, I would have given up way before that. And then in Jack, Jack Canfield, Mark Victor Hansen picked, pitched chicken soup for the soul to 153 different publishers. You can imagine that 152 of them are kicking themselves for not taking that deal. They've sold what a couple of billion, couple of several million copies of that book. So there's that. So just, you know, you got to be persistent. And the thing I, I find about that is like, what did Walt Disney learn 600 times pitching that business plan or pitching his business? One, you know, I remember getting a just on a side. I remember seeing a memo, a, a, a blog post or something from this woman who was complaining that she would pitched a dozen investors and came with the conclusion that investors just don't like women. And I had to respond to that that post. I just said, I can't let you get away with that. Because you, know, you pitched a dozen investors and came up with the conclusion that investors just don't like women. And, you know, I said, maybe those dozen didn't. Okay, not to worry, but, you know, you've only pitched a dozen people. So what Disney learned along the way, I'm sure, is which investors liked him, first of all. So who? So part of what you learn along the way is who who is amenable to you, likes you, and who likes your deal? And ultimately, after 600 times, you figure out, you know, who likes me and my deal. So it's a combination of things. And it's, it's of course, Disney didn't have business plan software. He didn't have an SBDC and people to help him figure it out. He was just pitching anybody and everybody. And so there is something to learning about who you want to know who is amenable to or interested in your kind of deal. So you're not going to pitch a biotech product to a telecom company. That's not that a lot of investors aren't that tightly dialed in, but you want to go to investors who know something about your industry. Now, the good news about that is they know something about your industry and they can help you and do more things. The bad news is they know something about your industry, so you better have your act together because they know what you're talking about. So that said, I think of another aspect of being a good you know, entrepreneur who will succeed is there's a, I think about the you know, there's, there's the missionary and there's the mercenary. And the missionary, I run into a lot of missionaries because the missionary is just like, just give me the money, I'm gonna save the world. And the good news is the missionary will go down with the ship, they'll die trying. They'll do everything they can. They'll do what they can to make this thing happen. The part that makes the, gives the investors the willies is that they're missionaries and the fact that they, they're probably pretty bad at running businesses, just don't know what they're doing. But just give me the money, I'll save the world. So hold that thought. Now, on the flip side of that coin is the mercenary. The mercenary is all about the money. They certainly know how to run a business, most likely. The investors like that. But the part about them that gives the, the investors the willies is that, you know, they'll find a better deal and they'll jump ship. So they won't be around. They won't go down with that ship. They won't die trying. And so what I look to do is to teach you guys or to, just to bring up the idea of if you could balance the missionary and the mercenary aspect of yourself. So if you're a mercenary, you know, get the missionary part going. And if you're a missionary, learn what the mercenaries know. It's kind of like in the Wizard of Oz, you know, you've got the, the scarecrow needs a brain, the tin man needs a heart, and we might as well go on and say the lion, 
the lion needs some cojones to, to make this thing happen. So you really need all three of those things to go and you need to be persistent. So start there. Okay, there's that idea. And then there's the whole thing about, you know, we've got to raise money. How much money do I need to raise? And I love telling this story about a customer of ours where, you know, he used our biz plan builder business planning software. He went to speak to some investors. And what he wanted to do, he's a young guy, he had a couple of friends, and these guys were all, you know, Learjet pilots. And they wanted to raise capital so they could buy a couple of Learjets to start a jet charter service. And you can imagine what that's going to cost. And it's just like, whoa, these things are like three or four million dollars a piece. And so the investors, you're not going to find a venture capitalist who's going to go for that. You're probably not going to find any investor for that matter in that kind of deal. And he was pretty frustrated. We were talking about it. I said, well, do you know a guy who's got a couple of planes already? And sure enough, he did. And so this guy, the gentleman he went to had two Learjets and they were in a, in a, in a, in a, like a jet management program with a company because these guys aren't flying them all the time, but there actually can be a decent investment, or at least if you want a jet and you want to write it off, you put it in a leaseback program where a jet charter service uses your jet and, you know, and flies you around when you need it. But so my guy took his business plan to him and said, hey, you know, we can manage your jets. We can lease them out. We'll charter them. We'll do all that. And long story short, the business plan proved to this guy who owned two jets that his jets would be better off in my, my customer's uh, maintenance or you know, management program. And so now my guy got two jets basically free. Now how much money does he need to raise? Uniforms, some brochures, a website, a, a, an office at an airport. You know, that's really a couple of, couple of parking spaces for jets. And it really, the whole idea is, so here he went after someone who had what he needed. He didn't need to go get money to go buy the thing he needed. And I think a lot of us get fixated on raising capital so we can go buy the thing. And I just say point out that there is an opportunity to just go around that and go get the thing from someone who has it. And those guys aren't nearly as sophisticated an, as an investor as like a venture capitalist would be. You know, James and I were talking about venture capitalists, and I point out that it's like, like we go buy a car. You know, we buy a car every couple of years, maybe every seven or eight years, whatever it is. We don't buy a car that often. But those car salesmen are there selling cars every single day. Likewise, venture capitalists are looking at pitches, pitch decks, listening to us get up there in front of them and pitch our deal day in and day out. And hopefully we do this just once, hopefully not 600 times, but basically one deal that we're, we're pitching over and over again. And so these guys are really good at it. We're not. So just having that in mind, you've really got to have a good pitch together because you're talking to some sophisticated people. And that's just important to, you know, have that, have, keep that in mind. Another thing, you, know, you may be looking at investors, but there's another way to go about it. Besides, there's lenders where now you have debt. Now, the good news is you can write off the interest and all that, but still you've got debt. You've got to pay it back. It's going to take out of your cash flow. If you have investors, you're going to cough up ownership in your business, which if this thing, this thing takes off and you go to sell it like your pharmacy deal, you want to have, you know, you want to have the most ownership in this business. So you make the most money when you sell it because this is where the VCs really, I won't say get you, but this is where they make their money is they, the appreciation on the piece of the business that you sold them. And that's what you are doing. You are selling your business to the VCs. So, and they're, they're getting a piece of it, but they're gonna own it and then they can buy more, get more later. Or if, there, if something happens, they can get more out of you. And then you're working for them. So this whole thing about starting your own business and having, having this freedom to be an entrepreneur and do whatever you gotta do, now you're accountable to somebody. And I just keep thinking that, you know, the reason I just didn't start my business so I could be accountable to somebody. I started my business because I'm motivated. I'm accountable to myself. And so that's kind of the whole point. But nevertheless, so, well, now the other alternative is called revenue royalties. Basically, the idea is saying, hey, uh, let me give me the money and I will pay you back everything, you know, your, your capital back out of a percentage of my revenue. So you could say, and there's a, there's a site you can go into online. And this whole thing was put together by a gentleman named Arthur Lipper. He was very prominent in the New York Stock Exchange back in the day, and he founded Venture Magazine when that was around. Anyway, he created this thing called Revenue Royalties, a, a site for it. 
And I did a deal with the, with an angel. And so the angel gave me a hundred thousand dollars. And then I said, okay, I'm going to pay you that back with a percentage, like 1% of my revenue from year six to the years 10 or, you know, and, and whatever, you know, as soon as I paid back the money he gave me, then that percentage would reduce and then maybe go from years 10 to 20 at a 10th of a percent. But you can, you can imagine this can be variable in every which way. And this, and a lot of these investors are getting older. You know, these guys are in their 70s and their 80s, and they can't wait for you to build your business and then sell it to somebody or take it public 10 years later. They want to get, at least they want to get their paid in capital back as soon as possible. So you want to, you want to engineer the deal to where they're going to get paid back their money soon as, first, because that's, that's really what's at risk for them. The upside, the return on that investment, they can be more flexible because that's the gravy on it. So uh, there's a, I've got a, a booklet you can get. It's, it's, I call it my booklet, How to Gain the Advantage with Investors to Fund Your Business. And there's a whole chapter in there on revenue royalties. But you can just imagine different ways of structuring these deals. And, and you can do a combination. You could sell them some stock. You could borrow some money. And you can pay revenue royalties. So it's a whole mixture of ways to get the money you need, depending on what the investor might be have a, have, a, have a taste for. And so that's just some options uh, in, in funding your business and getting this thing funded. You're not stuck with going to one investor and having them get a piece of your action and you know owning it, or owning a part of your business until what it, and, and they're gonna want you to sell it and you may not wanna sell it. You may wanna run this thing forever. It's, you know, it could be a great business and you love doing it and why would you wanna sell this thing? So, but, and then you could figure out a way to pay them off, but that's just some ideas there. What else I want to tell you about? Oh, the other thing I, I think I, I see a lot in, in pitching businesses is that, you know, if you've got say 20 minutes to pitch your business to an investor, I've seen people spend 15 of those minutes selling the product as if they're selling the investor the product. And you're not selling your product, you're selling the company. They don't want to buy your product, they want to invest in your business. And so it's kind of like the difference between the, selling a can of Coke and the Coke machine, two entirely different things. Now, sure, they're interested in the Coke, but they want to know how the machine's going to do. And that's really what you need to keep in mind is how this is a business that's going to make them a ton of money. And the other thing about venture capitalists, we, we sometimes think of venture capitalists as, or investors, are, they're there to help us. They're there, they're there to help us, give us money and help us. They are, in a, in a sense, they will help you because they want to get the return on the investment. But make no mistake, they are in the business to get a return on that investment that they gave you. Because they got to turn around to the people who gave them the money. I mean, the venture capitalists are kind of caught in the middle and they've got, to, they've got investors who have given them money that they've got to prove that they've, they're really good at applying that money to businesses that are going to succeed. And VCs are all judged on how well did you do with the money that you were given or invested in you guys to turn it around and make a profit. So they're entrepreneurs just like the rest of us. They seek capital, they apply the capital, and to the degree that they win, they get more capital. And so they come and go and they're kind of scared about that. But you know, there is the truth to the fact to the matter that we're, you know, they'll look at like 10 businesses and it's okay, nine of these are gonna lose money or we're gonna lose it. But one of them is gonna make up for all the losers. And that's where you get the Airbnbs and the, and the Ubers and, and those kind of things. But speaking of those, Uber, as you probably know, the CEO got booted. So the investors have some say in you know, your company and who runs it. So if you give them enough of an investment in it and you don't do well, they can boot you and replace you with somebody else who will do well. So just that's just one of those little gotchas with investors in there. Zuckerberg was smarter than that and he maintained more control of his business. So no matter what the investors do, they can't kick him out. So <laughs> there's, there's different ways to play this game. And, you can't get into all those gory details, but just really to be aware of that, you know. Now, the thing I, I really, where the business plan really comes into play here, and what I say is the better job you do on your business plan, you know, the better deal you'll, you'll get with investors. And for example, let's say you can convince the investors that your business is worth, because here's what they say. You're, you pitched them you're all the way down to the wire. They're about to invest. They get the checkbook in their hand. And what they're going to say, so what's this deal worth? Because when they write you the check, they want to know what percentage of your business they're going to get. 
So when this business grows in the future, they're going to get a piece of that percentage. And that's what they're looking at as their return on investment. And so they'll look at you and go, so what's your deal worth? And let's say, you know, just to keep the math simple, you say, well, it's worth, it's worth $900,000. Okay. And the investor gives you $100,000. Well, your $900,000 worth of company and their $100,000 investment is what would be called the post money valuation of a million bucks. Your 900 plus their 100 makes a million dollar company. Okay. Because they gave you, it's 10, their 100,000 is 10% of that million dollars, right? Therefore, they get 10% of the business. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, if let's say, what if you could do a better job on your business plan, your presentation, your team, and everything else, and you get up there in front of these investors, and you can convince them that your business is worth a million nine. Well, not only is your business worth a million dollars more, but now when that investor gives you $100,000, they only get 5% of your company. And so this is where, you know, I hear people say, well, I don't need a stinking business plan. I know what I'm doing. I'm going to use a business model canvas. I'll give these, I'll get my pitch deck out and I pitch deck and a smile and I'll raise capital. These guys wait, they might get excited about that, you know, in your pitch and think this is really great. And you'll think, oh, I'm going to, I'm going to get the money. And then they go home and they wake up the next day. And you know how it is after you sleep on something, you wake up the next day and they've got questions. They're going to call up their technical friends. They're going to call up their financial friends. They're going to call up their market friends. They're going to talk to their spouse. They're going to share with it a cocktail. Hey, I'm looking at this investment. What do you think? And people are going to give them input. They're going to have a lot more questions that they're going to come back and ask you. So you need to be prepared with these questions. I remember being at, a, at one of these pitch, pitch fests. It was Curetsu Forum down in Orange County. And these guys had a really good pitch. It was an insurance play out of Nevada. They were incorporated in Nevada. And around the table were all these angel investors. And every single one of these guys could have written a check for their entire deal. And they all had their checkbooks out on the table. They could, they could write a check for the whole thing. And imagine that. You're in front of all these guys. You, go, oh, you know, how, I can't lose. You know, it's like they're all right here. They're all right in the barrel. I'm talking to them. They could write, they could write, a, write a check for my deal. And so one of the VCs goes, hold it here. You're incorporated in Nevada. I would never invest in a company incorporated in Nevada because you don't have to disclose who the other owners are of this business. And that gives me the creeps. And so you can just see all the VCs go like, ah, oh, the, the angels putting their money, putting their checkbooks back in their pocket. And the failure of, of the guy who was pitching this was, I mean, this is, this is kind of like used car sales 101, you know, it's like, well, if I could show it to you in red, would you buy it? You know, I don't want that white car. I want the red car. Well, you know, and so these guys fail to say, well, okay, we're just temporarily incorporated in Nevada. I can change it to any state you want. What do you want? Delaware, Wyoming, California. If I did that, would you invest? And they, they blew it. They just did not have the response to that question. I was just thinking, oh God, are you kidding me? How could you blow that so easily? Another great question I love, and this one's near and dear to my heart because I was investing in a, 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 an accounting software package way back before QuickBooks. And uh, one day I, I got a call and it, you know, it, this programmer was working on it and he dropped dead at his desk, just bam, you know, and I've talked to his wife and he just passed away. He was just, you know, gone. And so people die, you know? And so the question becomes, it's a more polite way of saying, rather than saying, well, what if you die? <laughs> They'll say something like, so what if you get hit by a bus? And so that's the question. And in fact, I put it in the business plan template because make sure that someone sees this question because it is one of those weird questions that comes out of left field. And the answer is so ridiculously simple that you, you, I hate to have anybody miss it. One is, I got a team. You know, here's my team all around me. So if something happens to any one of us, we're backed up with everybody else who knows what's going on. Especially if you've all worked on the business plan and you're all in alignment with where this is going, you can you can carry the carry the business forward. The second answer to that question is, and we have key person insurance on all of our team members, just in case something does happen to them, we can either reimburse you with your investment, or we can afford to hire a headhunter to find the new person and replace them. You're covered. You can imagine the investors, okay, and what this tells the investor is, you know, you are realistic, 
you I don't say you've been around necessarily, but you understand this and you're ready to cover the bases and you're reducing the risk. These guys look at risk. Everything's a risk. They just look at you and go, you're a risk. And so <laughs> I don't care who you are, everything's a risk. And so they want to they want to they want to know that the, the risk is reduced and, and what you're doing. And sometimes you have some risks that you can't reduce, but you can reduce them with an investment. So here's a big risk. And what you want to be sure is do if you have risks, which you're going to have them, you want to be upfront about them. So let me tell you about the risks in this business. You know, the Internet could could go down. The sun won't come up. I could drop dead you know, whatever, the other weird little risk that you're having, you want to be upfront about the risks because if you're not, and then they come up with the risks, now you're forever defending yourself. You know what I mean? It's like a good offense is your best defense. So you want to have, you want to be upfront about the risk and then say, look, and with the investment, the first thing we're going to do with this money you give us is we're going to do this, which is going to make that risk go away. So you're using the money to make the risk go away and taking the action that it takes. So now they they see that you're upfront about that and you're not afraid of it. You know what you're doing. You know there's risk. You acknowledge that there are risks. And there's that. And so the same thing would apply, say, to competitors. You could, a lot of people say, oh, we've got no competition. Aren't we smart? Well, you want to have some competition, at least figure out what the competition might be. Like, for example, there's indirect competition. So let's say you're a roofing contractor. Uh, your indirect, your direct competition, obviously, is other roofing contractors. Your indirect competition would be, I don't know, a swimming pool, uh, landscaping, uh, a, a, a remodeled kitchen. You know what I mean? Kids going to college. So somewhere in here, you've got to produce or convince your client or your investor that you're a priority. Your investment, your thing is more important than the other stuff. And the way that the VCs sometimes put it, the questions, the three questions are very simple. It's like, you know, why your product or service? Why now? And why from you? So those are the three things, because you've got to get that urgency in there besides just the product. And of course, why are you the one to do it? And this is where you realize that when you're in the shark tank, they're looking at the person, they're looking at you. They're betting on the jockey, not the horse. So they're looking at you because you're the one they're writing the check to. Sure, that they're, they're writing the check to the to the company, but when it comes time to do something with the money, you're the people making the decisions as to where to invest that capital to build your business. So they're they're definitely looking at you, and so it's very important that you realize that you're this you're really the prize, the center of attention in this thing because the company's nothing, you know, without you. And so. I'm trying to think what else I want to tell you about all this stuff. You need to do. You need to. You need to know your numbers. You need to have a sense of. Oh, here's another one. So I was on a. I was. On a, I was on a, a, a panel of doing a judging a business plan competition at the University of Texas in Austin, and there are these. You know, all the teams had come and they pitched their business, and everybody was would so, say, and and, and the free, we're going to do a million dollars in our first year. And on the break, I, I thought to myself, you know, I said to the VCs, like four of the VCs on the panel and me, I'm the guy with the business plan software, so I was a little different, but it was like Shark Tank with me. Anyway, so I said to the VCs, I said, is it just me or does everybody do a million dollars in their first year? And they all just burst out laughing. They said, you'd be, so you'd be blown away how many times we see that. Everybody's gonna do a million dollars in their first year. And it just doesn't happen. And so what you got to do, and I can show you this in my financial model, but we've got a, a field where you list, this is your total available market. So let's say you're, you know, I've got a thing where I'm, uh, this example I use is like you're selling boat anchors, go figure. Anyway, so there's like sailboats, power boats, houseboats, tugboats. These are all the different segments of different kinds of boats. And what you want to do is you want to say, okay, how many people are there who have who are in this certain customer, you want to have your customers in segments. And you want to have a very credible source. Like I could tell you, you could go pick up a copy of Sailing Magazine. I'm make, pulling this out of the air, but you know, copy of Sailing Magazine. And somewhere in the mass that it'll tell you, we've got 350,000 subscribers. Or you could go online or wherever and find out how many subscribers somebody has, how many members of an organization there are, uh, something like that. And you want to put, you're starting out with real numbers that you can verify. So the investor can look at this because they're going to do the due diligence. And due diligence means they're going to verify that everything you say, everything you claim is true and real. 
and I talked to one friend of mine who's a VC. I said, so how many mistakes do you allow people on due diligence? I mean, how many, you know, if like you've got a team and you know one person really didn't get that college degree, but they say they did, or your numbers are that far off. He says, I said, it's like three strikes and you're out. And he goes, no, they get none, no strikes, one strike and you're out. And I thought, whoa, yeah, I kind of thought they'd cut a little more slack than that, but they really, they don't, they can't afford to. You know, they're looking at the 10 business deals. Every single one of them should be a home run, but they know that really only one of them is probably going to be a home run, but they got to treat every single one of them like it's got to be that home run. And that's you. And so, and, you know, and these guys, you know, the good news is these guys pray every day to their gods that somebody is going to walk in their door, hopefully you, and have something worth investing in. And so they're real dead serious about this stuff. And so you've got to start at least start with some numbers that are factual, they are uh, verifiable, and they're very real. And then you start, as so you list all those guys, and now you've got a whole market full of these different customer segments. And then you start talking about, okay, what percentage of this market do I think we can get? You know, and so, and the other thing I want to say there is never, ever say, if we just got 1%, if we could get 1% of everybody in China to buy our drink, we'd be golden. This is another one of those million dollars in the first year, you know, things that just, it's just, it's just a flashing red light, you know, just saying, ah, ooga, ooga, danger, Will Robinson, you know, get out of here. And so you've got to, you've got to think about, and really think about, is it 10% of the market? They'd rather see you get a 30% market share of a small marketplace than a 10th of a percent of a giant marketplace. Just, just talk about that. But then that trends, and you want to think in terms of market share versus, I know a lot of people say, oh, we're going to sell 500 of those in the first year. How do you, well, prove to me, somehow show me how you arrive at selling 500 of those in your first year. Now, you could reverse engineer this thing. So there's a there's a 100,000 people. I'm going to get a half a percent of that, and I'm going to send out mailings to these people, a certain kind of response, and you can actually reverse engineer and prove that you can prove that, and that's, believable. So you want to have something. I remember a venture capitalist said to me one day, he gets in my face, he goes, show me something I can believe. You know, and I think, okay, you know, back off. <laughs> but that's that's really what you're doing. You, you can't do anything that's far-fetched. It's got to be believable. Now, they can negotiate with you what they think the market, you know, uh, penetration rate you're going to get would be. But nevertheless, once you have your total available market, then you get that penetration rate that everybody agrees on. The rest is math. So then now it comes down to, okay, that translates into how many people are gonna, are gonna buy, buy your thing. Then you've got price, and then that multiplies into number of units and total revenue that comes in. You could do well more than a million dollars in that first year, but at least the investors know how you got here from there. And that's, that's crucial. There's a competitor we have that, you know, you drag the graph and it makes a pretty, it makes a pretty graph, but then the numbers all fill in but I defy you to explain how to your, to your investors how you came up with those numbers in some realistic way. And once they figure out what you did, you're toast. So that's something to consider. Anyway, so, I don't know, I can, what else can I think of telling you? That's, do you guys have any questions or anything about stuff that current burning issues that you've got going right now in your own, your own deals? How about you, Liz, James? You I was guys, just going to say, you need an action plenty of, plan. Plenty of, plenty of stuff. <laughs> <clears throat> it seemed to me like what you're describing there, Burke, is that they have realistic numbers, but then you also have an action plan to demonstrate that you know how to get there, right? Because otherwise, yeah. I mean, you could make up some numbers, but you want to demonstrate that you actually have a plan and you and your team know how to go from A to B. Yeah, you know, I remember talking to an attorney friend of mine in Silicon Valley, and he says, look, what you want to do is you want to design your business so everybody gets rich the same way. That's just one other thing in there about that. So because, yeah, and, and you, like you said, you know, and so for example, you're going to go along with it, you know, you and I could buy a building and I want to fix it up and rent it and you want to fix it up and sell it. We got a problem. I mean, it's not a catastrophic problem, but it's just a simple illustration of 
making money differently and having different expectations, which can cause problems. So you want to have your people on the same page, the same team, and who can, who, when they all answer the VC's questions, can tell you, this is what we're going to do. This is how we, this is our strategy. This is how we're going to go about it. And if that doesn't work, here's plan B. Here's a different strategy. So there's that. And I built the thing into our, into our uh, financial model where the sensitivity analysis, because everybody wants to know, so, so what's the worst case scenario and what's the best case scenario? And some people will give you three different financial models. I just think that's painful. I don't want to look at three different financial models and try to sort it out. Oh, this is the conservative one. This is the aggressive one. This is the original one. We made one page that goes through a financial model where down the middle of it is what you planned and two columns on either side. One's the best case, one's the worst case. You simply say sales are going to be 70% of total and or 120% of total or whatever. And then it's just, and not trying to, like every single line item has got to, no, overall sales is going to be this, overall sales is going to be that. And then costs are going to be this and that. And you get down to the bottom and say, what are the percentage of these scenarios? And you can basically come up with a weighted average of worst case, best case, plan case, and a number that somebody, again, will believe after factoring in the probabilities of the worst case and the best case happening. And so you've got that. And so it's just trying to show these investors that you've thought of everything. And the other, above all, I would say you really, really, really need to respect the money. I remember way back when somebody talking about some rich guy goes, oh, that guy's so rich, he doesn't care about the money. I don't know, the more money I've made, the more of a cheapskate I've become. Because the people who've made the money and keep it you have developed a, a practice or a way of being or a mental state of being cheapskates. And, you know, it sounds bad. And maybe that's not quite the word for it. But you got to respect the money. Just because they've got a lot of money and they'll spend money on certain things because they want the best, they're very careful about that. So you've got to be of one who's like really respects their money and you hold that paid in capital they're going to give you is this is golden and you're going to pay this back to these guys as soon as possible. And so it's just sort of a... I don't know, just sort of a, a, an energetic way of, you know, of being. You've got to, you know, be that, you know, with it. And that's, I think, a lot of this. A lot of the plan and planning really is for yourself. So you can look these guys in the eye. You can be that that entrepreneur on the stage on Shark Tank, and really have your act together and stare them all down, and you know, talk turkey when it comes to making investment. In you, in Shark Tank, for what it's worth, uh, you know, it's reality TV. It's entertainment. So you can imagine they're going to have one person out of five who's got their act together, and the other four are are all cannon fodder for comedy and and stupidity and like I can't believe that guy you know all that stuff and it's amusing you know but I think it's kind of tragic but nevertheless it'd be be kind of nice if it was educational I'd love to be on one of the pan the shark panels that you know I'd be the guy you got to do this this and this to get this thing to work and then maybe Mr. Wonderful will throw some money at it but you know. They're not there to do that. They're there. They're there. They're sharks. They're not dolphins. They're or goldfish. They're they're there to chew you up and spit you out, or chew you up and swallow you and tear your arms off and stuff. They don't care. They want. They're in there for the money. So there's that. So Ash, chime can... in there. You had your hand up. Is that Bash? No. Yeah. Yeah. You got to unmute Bash. Yeah, I'm trying this pad. Um... So, Burke, um, you, you, you covered a lot of things. And like I said, I'm pretty much a beginner in this business thing and drilling down and trying to learn things. So besides your uh, How to Gain the Advantage with Investors book, uh, uh, generally, uh, how can I prepare for uh, investors' questions that you, you've covered a symphony of them? So I just want to be as prepared as possible when I do go out and uh, so is there uh besides your book is there another site or something that i can go to because I, I just can't keep all this that you're you know, that you've cared that no, you're saying. i know it. yeah I did, a lot of this stuff is is covered in that book but yeah there's well it's businesspowertools.com is, is my company is my website businesspowertools.com and there's biz plan builders is would be the business plan that we we've made for this 
And so that would be my, my big pitch to you guys would be to use that. It really, it started out a long time ago. It's just evolved over the years. We've added a bunch of products other than the marketing plan and public relations and employee handbook. So let's say you, you do get the money or you do succeed. You want to have job descriptions and employee policies and things for your people because you know, I, I see these companies, I work for companies that just think, oh, the stupidest thing can, can take a company down. It's just tragic. And you know, I think of, I think hopefully you guys, I think of guys, you know, maybe you guys have something that's going to save the world. You want to build a business around it. I want to help you succeed. So the thing you have that's going to save the world will make it. And that can be your business. And so that's maybe that's my, my altruistic missionary bit showing through. But um, yeah, you still need to run a business. I can show you the business plan if we want to take the time. It's been, I don't know how long and it's been. Point out, but Burke, it's been. I think you've got something in there too um, in your software that provides some coaching and guidance on developing your actual pitch deck. Isn't that right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. You have some information in there that walks people through what ought to be in your pitch deck when you go to pitch investors. We, yeah, it's actually a sample pitch deck template. And you can go online, you can download Ubers and Airbnbs and all the famous pitch decks you want. But I, th I don't think they're going to show you or explain to you exactly what they were thinking in the process of putting this together. And in ours, it's, it's deliberately not pretty, but it's, it's a PowerPoint slideshow that's online. You can you, you build your slideshow on it. But it's got the actual instructions. Okay, what needs to go here? You know, and this is the part where you show the the pricing. This is the part where you show the product. And just one slide on the product because we don't. And there's a commentary in there next to it saying, "Remember, the investors don't want to buy your product. They want to invest in your company." So, just explain the product and then explain the value proposition. Like, why are people going to buy this? Why is it better than what they've already got? Why are they going to make this change to you and that kind of thing? So. Yeah. And the business plan itself is a template that the real secret sauce in the business plan is the fact that it's mostly written. We're going to edit it because it's, if you had blank pages, you wouldn't know what to say. I mean, you could say, describe your management team here, but like, how, like, what do I say? Pramod, do you have a question? Yeah. So um, how much time do you think uh, we need to prepare? Like how, how much time we get to do the pitch, like one minute or two minutes, how, what is the typical time template which we had to prepare for a piece? So, I understand your question. Is how much time do you have to present your business to yeah, investors? Yeah, right. So, typically, what would be the time? Some of some places I see like five minute speeches, like there, there are like one minute. So, what is your typical uh, thing? What well, you see from your experience? Yeah, you know what? You want to have like a, a thirty-second, what they call it. You call it an elevator pitch. It's really, or it could be a minute, you know. But but you imagine you're in an elevator. That's where it comes from. You're in an elevator. And you're going like three or four floors. I was at some conference, and this person was saying, "Yeah, you're in the elevator, going like twenty-six floors." I mean, where's twenty-six floors? No, you know, you're not going to go. Maybe New York, but you know, you don't. Have, it's not it's three floors. You've got that much time, and then otherwise they're like they're out and they walk out the door, you know. So. That really were so call it 30 seconds to a minute to answer that so you want to have that pitch you want to have like the 20 minute pitch but that usually comes with some kind of pitch deck so you can you can talk to the slides it's show and tell you can explain it to them they usually give you 20 minutes and so or 15 minutes and then there's questions and answers and you can set that up and, and and tweak it which in every which way but um i was going to say it's really not the elevator pitch i'd say it's really more the uh the buffet line is you know you're at a conference and you're you got your plate and you're putting your food on the plate and a guy in front of you or a person behind you behind you hey so what do you do this is when you you whip out your 30 second or a minute minute present pitch on here well i got you know and you talk about do you realize that there's people what do i say i said there's 388 million businesses in the world and according to inc mag or to the sba of the businesses that failed 60 percent of them had no business plan and think about we're surfing on a tsunami of startups these days. I've got a software product for helping people write a business plan. It's the economical. It helps them. It's, it, they simply edit it, and they can produce a business plan, believable financial models, and a, and a credible pitch deck that if you were going to invest in them, you'd feel comfortable in writing them a check on the spot. I'm looking to raise a million dollars to put this business plan into an online platform 
enabling me to get if I got one if I got 0.26% of that 380 million I'd have a million subscribers paying me $97 of a month or $27 I have different prices pay me an average of 50 bucks a month you know what I mean how long does it take to say that and it's, so it's just like bam 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 and so uh, that's a, a variation of my own <laughs> I haven't talked to investors in a while in my business but self but that's kind of what it, how, it, how it sounds like. They're like, oh, okay, that sounds interesting. Now, now what do they want? Now they want the now they want those. Do you have a do you have like a summary of like an executive summary? This is where the two pager. You know, I say printed on on both sides of the same sheet of paper, so it perceived as one piece of paper. They'll read that. Now they're not going to read your 30, 40, 50 page business plan because. For the most part, and from my experience reading those business plans, remember, I was going to choke somebody after a year looking at those. I can imagine these VCs looking at them every day. They're awful. This is why people don't read them. It's because they suck. And so this is why I started this business, because these people had some great ideas. And it was tragic that their plans sucked and their plans were killing them versus, you know, shooting them into the stratosphere. And so... That's so anyway, that's the different variations of pitch, but that's but you start with the big plan so you understand the big picture, narrow it down to the 20 minute thing, narrow that down to your two pages, and narrow that down to 30 seconds or a minute. And that's that's how it that's kind of how it goes. Is that more than answer your question? Yes, that, that is. Thank you. <laughs> and I remember I was, I was, I was at the University of Louisiana, I was talking to there's a kid sitting in front of him as a kid. I don't know how old he was, but skinny little dude. And he looks at me and goes, how, how mentally tough do I need to be to, to succeed in business? And I, I looked at him and I thought, well, you know, look, put one foot in front of the other and you just keep going. And since I went out and, you know, for, I had my own bully experience as a kid, I wanted to get, take karate lessons. So I went out, took karate lessons and got a black belt just because I didn't want to be afraid of anybody. And so I told him, I said, you, you're skinny and you're small. Go take karate class. That'll do wonders for your, you know, for your, your, your whatever's, you know. Plus, you get in really good shape doing it. It's a great way of developing coordination. And when you're in a boardroom and someone's screaming at you, you don't have any fear. Just like, okay, yeah, you know, or you get over here and hit me or something. I don't think so, you know. So, I mean, that, it's amazing what it does for, for, the, for just knocking the fear out of things. Uh, it's a good, really time to, a good time to plug your book. Bert. Yeah, I wrote a business black belt just for the occasion because I started my business at the same time I started my karate training. I finally was stopped driving around the block and just drove into the parking lot and said, how does this karate class thing work? And the guy says, come back tonight at 7.30, wear a t-shirt and shorts and we'll get started. Okay. So you just show up. You know, it's, it's, that's, you know, it's all about that show up. Yeah, thanks, Liz. I appreciate that pitch promo there. <laughs> you know, um, I allowed you to uh, share your screen there, Burke, if you wanted to oh. uh, jump into that um, tool real quick. Okay, I appreciate that, James. Thanks. So here goes. So here's what it looks like. Let me get this other thing out of the way here. So there's a 14 or two week guest access. You guys could just go in and, you know, name, email, come up with a password and get to this. Zoom doesn't do any favors for the speed of this thing because I get two things going to two different web platforms and that's even though my system's pretty quick, it's going to be a little slow that way. So anyway, here's what it looks like. This is this I took. I had all these different software products over the years selling them through retail stores and I said, you know, I want to put all this into a dashboard online where everything works together and works alike. And once you learn how to use one, you can use everything versus having to learn hundreds of individual apps to do all this stuff. And so here's the, here's what it looks like. And so there's the business plan panel. All the panels look alike fundamentally. It's just really for consistency and I think sanity purposes. You can see there's different things here. There's we have a CRM built into it. There's a finance panel with more things in them. Each one opens up, moves everything else out of the way and shows you some of the financial models. That are in here. So there's, there's master documents and when you open a master document, it creates a template. And so you can open up the template. Now you can't you can't destroy the masters, but you can modify the template. Everything's completely uh, modifiable here. So you just click one of these things open. It pop this case, it pops a spreadsheet. This was made way back when 
when I wanted to evaluate the the viability of buying an airplane. You know, can you pencil this out? So I do. I love doing all these things. I can't. I don't do math real well in my head. And a lot of these these things are so complicated to figure out. But you can figure out the purchase price, the financing, the fixed expenses. You're going to sell it someday in seven years. You know, what's this thing cost to to rent it? What's it cost to, for gas and management, everything else? And you can see what the financing looks like, the operating expenses look like, the future sale, the cash flow, the tax effect, and what's the break even on this thing? This thing goes this way because it's got a different number in it but anyway you get the idea of what it costs to fly this thing and does an airplane pencil out rarely but <laughs> at, least you know, at least you know what it is but a friend of mine he had he had a, a caterpillar dealership up in canada and he said this spreadsheet was better than the one he got from caterpillar to evaluate somebody buying a, a bulldozer and leasing it to a construction company so what do you know anyway there's an hr thing in here legal agreements a bunch of more stuff under management. There's you know board meeting minutes. It's all the other stuff you need. You know marketing spreadsheets. Again, more calculators, agreements. There's a handbook of marketing. All kinds of procedures. There's a safety plan. If OSHA shows up at your front door for a courtesy visit, that's the same as a highway patrolman pulling you over on the side of the road. They didn't pull you over to say hello. They didn't come in for a courtesy visit because they're being courteous. They're looking for problems, infractions, and you'll probably walk walk out the door with about, you know, fifty to seventy thousand dollars worth of infractions unless you do your safety plan right. So we got procedures baked in here, all these different things you can do, and, and everything here you can hit the plus sign. It opens up an editor, and you can drop something new in. You can even create your own templates using the different kinds of variables that are in this thing. So you can do that. But let me go back to the back to the business plan because that's really what we're talking about here. So the business plan builder is here. Oh, you go up to your under manage account at the top here, and this is where you fill in all your company information. So this is the stuff that's rather than having you to have to type this over and over and over and over again throughout all your documents we put it here and then when you open your document up those variables automatically grab this data out of here and you can go in and put your own logo in it you put your own tagline in it so you can see i put this tagline here subscribe to business power tools now update and then it comes back Something's wrong with my browser today. I don't know what the problem is. It's just weird. This see, then this now shows up, <laughs> and you can you know put your own logo, customize, put your own logo on it. That's just because it's got mine on it now. And then you can manage other users. This is where you guys can you can work together. The collaboration. This is this is important stuff I think because you want to have your people weigh in with you. And here's one user. If you want to, you know, you can go in and say, okay, this person can have access to all these different tools. But for example, the business plan, this person could be the administer, miss administrator, or they could be just a reviewer and have read-only access, or they could be the member who actually is working on, on this project. And so you can set up and, and control who's got what kind of access to all kinds of things in here. So back to the business plan, I've got several loaded in here, but this one is for cannabis, can, the cannabis business. And so we call it cannabis club. All this information is in here, but you can go in and change it. So there's that. And then you can go in and add, you know, an unlimited number of founders, but I keep it to no more than be a handful. But nevertheless, you can do what you want to do. And then down here is another variable where we're trying to get people to, you know, what industry are we in? Because we wanted to fill in that blank and all, because all the documents will say something in the XYZ industry, we do this. And so what we put here is we wanted to have this be, we are in the context of where this variable goes, because a lot of people don't understand the context. And that's the beauty of a lot of this, of, of these templates is that you see the context of where the information is going. There's, we used to have a wizard. There's a number of business plan templates out there that are software out there that'll say, answer all these questions and we'll print your plan for you. Well, how do you answer the questions if you don't quite really know like, where does this go? What goes around it? before you do that. And we have a variety of templates to start with. In this case, the cannabis is medical. This would be ordinarily would say products and services. In this case, I just have services over here, but these would be the different kinds of, of ser services. And so save and next. 
and it gets to the plan itself. Now, this has got a lot of subsections opened in it, but you can see, we, we wanted to break it into subsections because as you can see, there's little blue boxes and the little blue boxes mean if you check the box, it's going to be included in your plan. If you don't check the box, you don't, it's not going to be included. And so the idea here is you're going to go through it. The first pass is check the boxes and the parts you want to include. So usually it's going to be the executive summary. And the executive summary opens up and the green text is us talking to you guys, like we're sitting next to you saying, hey, remember to do this. And these are all in, you know, in line with where you want to go. But you can see how, you know, here's business power tools is already filled in. You know, there's different places here. It should say somewhere it has the cannabis business in it, you know, all the way along. And there's me. I've got my name in this thing. That, that's filled in automatically. And a bit about the business and the shares and stuff. But this is the piece that's the one where you print it on two sides of where I'm saying it right here of that sheet of paper, this is what you're gonna print out. Now we've got the templates up here. So some of these will show up blank. If it's blank, you just click on the template and add, the, add it to your plan. You can insert your own document there if you want. So you can do that right away. And you know, But this takes it and drops it into the editor. And you can see it's an editor that has, you know, I guess everything you'd expect from an editor. And then there's the explanation. This is a little more background on the executive summary. So rather than reading a whole book or taking a class and then going over and getting a business, starting to write your business plan and thinking, okay, what did they say about that and that class and how do I do this? We put, it's all kind of like goes right along with you. So it's all rolled in together. And then there's notes. The notes are kind of like a post-it note on the side. We wanted to have a place where someone could say, you know, hey, I got a question about this. This is we were you could give an investor access to your plan, give them read only access. The investor could come along here and say, hey, I think you missed something or I got a, a question here. What do you do about that? And then uh, over here, there's a video, which is me, which is these things are this one's two minutes. The executive summary. This is a very important part of your business plan because this is the one part that the investors actually want to see. They're gonna say, you meet them in the elevator, you give them the elevator pitch, you find them somewhere, they say, yeah. They don't say, send me your business plan. They say, yeah, send me your executive summary. Keep it to about two pages, maybe three tops. Anyway, more of me. But anyway, so there's, there's that. And so every one of these sections has got something like that baked into it. So there's a video over here talking about that one, and it's different. There's a template for it. There's an explanation. There's the content. So you can see the contents here. And I'll share an interesting hack with you that I discovered. This is simply uh, what I think is really kind of cool, actually. And so, you, well, first of all, you see there's these subsections, so you don't need all of them. This is overkill. So you're going to sort this out, but you know, it, it, but at least it's easier. You, you know, here is the cannabis essential oils industry bit that's filled in. The idea is there's more here than you're going to need, and you go through it and you say, what what is it going to take to describe my business? Again, you're after that million nine. So you get the 100,000, they only get 5%. So it's really worth going to the effort, if you call it that, to really build this thing. But I think we've given you a lot of ideas on how to do this. And so, for example, here, what I've said is, you know, I'm saying people often ask, well, how do I, how do, I do market research? How do, where do I get the information about the market? You know, investors want to know this. And so we have a place to insert graphics and things. And you can go in and upload a graphic, or you can get a graphic off the Internet. And so what I tell people to do is simply this, and I think it's in the explanation, you know, it's in the explanation here. So, which is go out and get infographics. So here's what I've done. I looked at the market analysis. We said, okay, let's look at the infographics. And I, have, I went out and got some already for you. So if I typed in infographics, cannabis market USA, look at what I get on the web. You think you could find a credible graph or image or something here that would be convenient? You can see this one. We use that one. Even there's some nice pictures, but you could completely illustrate your business plan with these kinds of graphics. And all you're doing is you're simply copying the link in from that graphic. So you're looking at the graphic. You hit your right uh, copy image link. You right click that copy image link. Boom. You go back here. You click this, you paste it there, 
you can resize it or you can just you know drag it and make it bigger or smaller and there you go and this is how you can populate your business plan with all kinds of pictures credible stuff and this is what's going to convince the investors that you've got your act together and you can put this throughout the entire plan and do this stuff all over the place so this is how you really make your builds it build that case i'm all about helping you build your case it all boils down to the laser focus at one question what's your deal worth is it a nine hundred thousand or is it a million nine or is it nine million whatever you know it all boils down to that and that's your magical moment that's the thing that comes down to that's what real difference in the money is is just is right there so uh, at risk of beating that to death that, that's the deal there we do have a, a baked in uh, financial model wizard that you go in through here and you can say okay what kind of revenue type is this to set this thing up in this case I started one it's called weed because we're in the cannabis club business so we were selling weed and so uh, how many units are you going to sell in the first month this is kind of like kind of goes against what I was telling you before where you know you're making up these numbers but at least you can see where you got them from and then after that month seven through twelve you're going to bump it by five percent and the year, second year, more and more. And so you're showing your cost, your price per unit. There's a sales commission on it. There's returns and allowances. Then you get down here to your people. You know, what's this going to take? You know, who are, who are the executives? You can fill in their people, your names, how much they make, when they start. You can delete them. You can add more in here. And just fill this thing in, and you end up with the reports you're looking for. Like here's a, a where's income statement yearly, let's say. Pick that one. It's a little small, but you know, they'll, and then when you, so the, the, all those numbers fill in, and then when you want to export it, you can create the export that you could send to an investor or whatever. I really suggest you keep this whole thing in the dashboard and let the investors see it in the dashboard, because every time you make a change and they come and look at it, they're always going to see the latest thing. Just saying. But so now the other thing I was telling you about is the financial model. This is the, I'll show you the, the big one here. This might take a moment to load because it's, it's a fairly large Excel workbook. And this is to be the one where I show you the part about how you build your revenue models up and have it be credible. Come on, it takes a second here. But this, the whole thing you can, you can collaborate and what's gonna happen is when you see the numbers, like if, if I was logging into your business plan and looking at your financial model, We've got a video that shows how this works and a bunch of things, some instructions and stuff, but I'll just do it for you. So the basic assumptions are this is where you have basic company name. I'd recommend when you put in your shares authorized, this is you put in, my lawyer told me, you know, put it in like 10 million. It, you know, it, this is where you get the shares authorized by the state because if you're gonna hire people, you say, hey, I'll give you five shares of stock to come work with me. It's like, that's not very interesting. But people don't do the math. You want to say, I'll give you 100,000 shares of stock. I think, ooh, that's kind of cool. Now, it's not worth any more than five shares of stock otherwise, but it just feels better and there's a, it just seems more generous. So you want to start out with a big number just for, you can see it's, it's the, you know, little post-it notes pop up. Every one of these has a little, not every one, but everywhere we get questions or have gotten questions over the past, like, what do you mean by that? You know, we put a little post-it note that pops up to give you some ideas and some so here we put in profit centers and so these are these could be your 10 products they could be your 10 profit centers we had a customer said well i've got 100 products i said you could do that and have 100 products in your financial model but you're gonna it's gonna be completely like you're gonna bury the investor they're not gonna be able to weed their way through it narrow it down 10. we got we're used to 10 or five you know we can handle that so uh, we even include an opportunity here for an intro offer, sometimes called a tripwire, which could be that lost leader thing you sell just to get the customer in the store. You know, you go to the gro the grocery store, sends coupons out. You know, steak, ten bucks off today. You know, oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna go down to Wiggly Piggly or wherever you go to Piggly Wiggly or Safeway to get a steak, and you end up with three hundred bucks worth of groceries. That's the idea. So let's see where these things populate elsewhere, and this revenue model is what I wanted to show you where you put the sailboat owners in and you can see here like you know what I what I you know one plan I was working I put in it said the source 
So if the investors look at this and go, where'd you, where'd you get this 350,000? Well, the source would say, Sailing Magazine has 350,000 subscribers. When they do their due diligence, they're gonna grab Sailing Magazine and goes, does this really have 350,000 subscribers? Or they'll look for some other source that has more, maybe, whatever. But that's the idea. So you're showing real numbers here that adds up. And you're saying, I think we can sell 2% or we can sell 10% of these sailboat owners. And you can fill it in. And this number here gives you an annual growth. So it automatically does a increase here. So even then, we're trying to shorten the amount of math you got to do. Even here, you can see the we think the subscriber base is going to grow. We think we're going to get a penetration is going to grow. So now we have 35,000 sailboat owners. We already have 10,000 in the hopper, so they're going to add up. And our first product's 100 bucks. This you see Graham's big idea here shows up. And then the probability of purchase, that's kind of a funky thing where you could have different people buying different products. And that's just that's just kind of it coordinates that. But look at how many units you've sold, how how many people bought, what this translates to in revenue, and what it turns out to be your first year. This is a far cry better than the simple million bucks. But at least what you can do here, there's an explanation. You can follow this explanation. And if someone looks at you and goes, there's no way you're going to get 10% of those guys. You're only going to get 2% of them. And you're only going to get you know 1.5% of those guys. And you just kind of keep going down the thing. And you can see, obviously, the numbers recalculate. And you've done differently. And then we have this thing at the bottom, which I think it was kind of like the, I should put an envelope graphic on this thing because it really is a, it's kind of the quick back of the envelope. If we continue to pay 20% for cost of goods and you know, our R&D is 15, you're not gonna spend this much money over time, which is the point of the rest of the model is sharpens the pencil on this. But the idea is you know, you've got your, so you've got this revenue model to show this is what sales are gonna look like. This is based on you know, how many customers are out there. And then we jump to a different page, which is capital requirements. And this is that, I think of it as a shopping list. It's all the things you can think of that you need money to build this business. I got to have all this stuff. I need all these things. I need a business plan out here. Obviously, you're not going to spend 5000 because you got software. Anyway, so, uh, you know, and, and we also show, that, you know, you don't need all, all the money at once. So this is showing you when do you need the money? What do you need the money for? And this is where, you know, you can just kind of figure in. And I, one of my models, I put in a, I put in an airplane. I wanted to see if they were paying attention. And sure enough, they they saw the airplane, you know, as well. And then over here, it goes to the, I'm, I'm sure, can you see the, tab, the little colored tabs at the bottom of the screen? Sometimes people don't see those. But at the bottom, I'm going from page to page in this giant Excel model. And here, all I've done is I've summarized the capital requirements because investors always ask, what are you going to do with the money? And so you show them, well, R&D hires are going to be this, it's expansion costs for that. We need this capital equipment, blah, blah, blah. And shows them this, gives them an idea of where the money's going to go. And then there's this, this thing here. I invented it, but I also noticed that Fred Wilson of, um, where is he? Flatiron Capital in New York. He writes a newsletter all the time. He talks about, you know, your, run, you know, your, your runway. How much, how much runway do I need? I need enough money to go 18 months. If that's the case, you can see how much money you're going to need. I, obviously, my, this model is not filled in, but you can see this adds it up 18 months. We're laying 303,650 bucks to go 18. I can go 18 months. If I need to go 24, I can't make it. Well, obviously, this one you can go the distance, but you know that's the idea there. And then there's a number of other. All the assumptions pages are, are individually done, so you can look at marketing. What have I pay, spent in the past? And what percentage of sales is that? And then we can show what percentage of sales do we want to allocate to different things over each year. And these are set up to run, to, to be calculated against sales because if you change those revenue numbers, all these numbers automatically float. So it's not like you're stuck with fixed numbers. So we're trying to make the whole process easy so as you make changes, it, it shows. I'm not going to beat this model to death because they're probably but I'm going to show you a couple of things at the very end of it. One is the ratio analysis. So when you're sitting, you're at the VC office and you got the young guys over there with their calculators. You start telling, talking about the math you're, you're doing, your numbers. They're over there with the calculator calculating. What's your current, quick current ratio? What's your days payable? What's your inventory turnover? What's your interest coverage? Blah, 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 all that stuff. Well, we're showing you what those numbers are already. 
and we're showing you what your three-year average is. We're giving you, we're showing you what the computation we use to get these numbers. And then we show you over here what the, let's go a little wide column, can narrow that up a little bit. This is the interpretation. This is what it means. So, and then we have a link here to BizStats. And BizStats is where like bankers will go to, to see if, now you're, you got a car wash and you've got doing a million dollars a year. How many employees should you have? So they can go look up, well, a million dollar car wash has got 50 employees and they should be doing this, this is what their numbers should look like. And so you get those numbers and you put the biz stats numbers in this column and this column next to it will tell you how close you are to industry averages for a company like yours. And if you've got a number that's seriously <laughs> like that one, seriously different than what this other one is saying, either A, go fix it and this will tell you where to look and B, come up with a really good explanation. At least you're ahead of them. You don't want these guys to be ahead of you and catching you, and now you're on the defensive. You, just, you, want, to be, you want to be proactive with these things and be ahead of these guys. Here is the sensitivity analysis I told you about, where you just say, look, on a bad day, you know, sales are going to be this. On a, on a good day with a tailwind, if we hit it out of the park, it's going to do that. And this shows, this just, you just follow the numbers. The blue numbers are the ones you change. The black numbers are the calculations. And we're just, you know, changing these numbers, seeing if this goes well, that doesn't go well. Here's your probability of each scenario. There's a number somebody can believe. And you can do this with the investor sitting next to you. And then you got the value, oops, then you got the valuation summary here, where you take the numbers out of the system, five years worth, and you show the, if you're, if, you know, if you borrow money at 8%, which is probably not realistic these days, it's less than that, but whatever. The investor wants a 40% return year over year. And there's 4 million founders shares. And these are where your round one and two are going to, all that stuff. This is going to show you the different types of valuation models that are used and all the way down to a average of all four of those methods. So you could come up with a pretty convincing gut feel in the back of your mind when someone says, what's this business worth? I think it's worth $14,900,000, you know, or 15 million bucks. And you have a reason to believe that because you've done the math with all the different methods that different people, you know, investors use to value, value businesses. And the last little bit here, well, oops, I went past it. There's a cap table where you can divvy up, you can see who gets what shares. I'm getting into the weeds and the detail, but you know, this gets into who gets how many shares of what, what does this mean if the investors get a bunch of shares? What are those shares worth at the end of the day? Because you want to know if is it worth in, get bringing investors in? Am I going to make more money by bringing in investors or am I better off bootstrapping this thing? And so when you get into this and see your numbers in it, this will make a heck of a lot more sense. And then we have an investor analysis page which shows what this all looks like and that's like you know overkill but this is quite the model to and it's just evolved this isn't something well, let's make this most complicated model we can imagine it just we just needed to make something that people uh it just kept you know it's just it's evolved from what people needed what investors wanted to see what you know guys like all of us wanted to develop and be able to be able to do the math and see it because it's complicated math and it, it's a lot of money involved and you want to and it makes a world of difference because you're going to be working you know 12 hours a day for five seven days a week you know to make this thing happen and uh you know it's it's you want to you want to get this right and this is this is the, the the powerpoint presentation that i just wanted to show you quick with that james was, was talking about and you can see it's not pretty, but it's designed to show you what to do and how to do it. This one is talking about the problem. Here's how many people, people want to know how many people got the problem. If only a few people got the problem, you're not going to have a very big business. But if everybody in the world's got the problem, pretty good idea, you got, got a pretty good business here. And then what is your product? And then why is it a good deal? Who are the customers? What are your advantages, your, your barriers to entry? How are you keeping competitors out? This is one here where you say, okay, we got competitors. Where do you fit in that world? And what's the trick here is there's these vertical pieces here. These are the ones where you wanna, you wanna adjust these. So your company shows up up here in this right corner and all your competitors are down in the low cost, low value, high cost, low value, you know, high value, high cost, 
all that, but you are in the Goldilocks sweet spot. And so you just figure out how to make that be. You can see we're telling you how to do that right here. So if that's what you do. Uh, the business model overview, basically how you how do you make money? And then here's where you sell a product. Who are your partners? I tell people there's three ways to the top of an oak tree. You get out a ladder and start climbing. You sit on an acorn or you make friends with a big bird. These are the big birds. So if you want to have those. And what have you done so far? You know, have you have you gotten some money? Have you built a prototype? Do you have a patent? What have you done with the money you've got so far? I tell people, how far can you go without raising capital and show these investors that you're pretty scrappy? You, can, you know, you got two Learjets already. Now what do you need money for? So it's just showing the more you can do without money is, is impressive because investors think, well, if, you, if you're that shrewd, imagine what you could do if you had some cash. So then you show them the financial model, what this thing looks like, which is we just went through all that. And who are the jockeys on this on this horse? And that's you guys. And then who do you have as advisors and directors? Who's the who's the wise and seasoned person you can call in a pinch who's got answers to questions? Or who's some of these dignitaries or experts in an industry that you know are uh, or people that are impressed, like, wow, you got, if, you have, if that guy believes in you, you must have something going. I mean, look at, there's a thing called Start Engine. It's a, it's an online investment site. And they've got Mr. Wonderful from Shark Tank is their, is their, is their, is their uh, mascot. And so to have him there, that must tell you something. And this talks about the different ways of what kind of, how you want to structure the investment. Like, give me a zillion dollars in shares of common stock and you'll own 5% of my business you know kind of a thing then of course okay what do you do with the money we're gonna do this and here's when we're gonna do it and then how do we get out of this thing because everybody wants to know how are they going to get their money back and you have that and then oops that was it and then the last slide this is the last slide that you have no it's not it's it's the summarizing you know why your product why now and why from you you can see that in the exit strategy and the unique company thing about you that you're flexible scalable unique whatever come up with something and the last slide is the one that remains as your backdrop while they're during Q and A and ask you questions. So you have that here: your name, your phone number, and a little a summary of a few things. You know, we've got ten products. There's 388 million businesses and experts, and that's your that's your final slide. And that just remains, you know, up when you're when you're doing that. So there's that. And just to throw in other things in here that make difference, I showed you there's advisors. Who are your advisors? How do you get an advisor to be with your business? Well, I happen to have a letter to a board of advisors. You click on this icon here, bada boom, up comes a letter, and it's got the variables baked into it. You can click, oh, the green is comments. You click a green button here, and the green comments all vanish. It comes up with a nice clean looking document. When you want to edit it, you click the edit button and now it opens the editor. I say leave the green stuff in there for a while, but you can see the variables are here. So you can either add some more or replace them or whatever you want to do. You don't want to delete them, but you can edit the text between the variables. You say we want planning and organize. We want, I want, you know, weekly meetings and blah, 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 and all these different things. And then you save this out. I'm not saving. I'm just going to put it up anyway. So it's there. And then when you want to fill it in, you click this and you can see the, business, the information, the kind of the mail merge stuff I showed you at the very beginning here is already baked into this. And now we're going to have, you know, James in here. And you can see as the document starts to fill in and I turn off the, let me turn off the comments. For some reason, my computer wants to make this thing go big. Anyway, what happened? Um, has that ever happened to you? Like your, your browser just suddenly makes everything huge. So here's James is here. James is there. James shows up down here. So the variables automatically fill in. You make this document and then you save it. And you've got this document that saves out down in the, so you've got these three different categories. There's the master templates. There's the templates that are variable templates. And then there's, there's your finished document. And this finished document, I didn't change, put any variables, but one guy's name here. But you can see the name is on here. And then you can mail this to somebody, put their email address in, bang, get sent off to them. And you don't have to get out of your chair. And you've not now got an advisor who's got an offer to come be with you. 
And so we've added a lot of extra things in here. We even have a handbook of business planning that explains more than everything you ever wanted to know about, uh, you know, everything. What a venture capitalist looking for, you know, all that stuff. There's a whole bunch of information there. There's a, these are blog posts that come out of the company that are just all kinds of things about, you know, what you need to do. And so there's a lot of this. So there's a lot of information. It's all right here, right here around the business planning process that you're doing. And so anyway. Well, thank you so much, uh, Eric. That, that, uh, that, I, I'm even more impressed now about that, that uh, tool than I was the first time I saw it. That's good to hear. <laughs> Yeah, there's just there's a lot to it. But like I say, you know, you're asking if you're asking for money and you want millions of dollars, you know, there's there's really not a whole lot of this you can leave out. And you yeah. don't have to do it all at once. You just do it. Can you just keep going and build it, build it, build it, build here, add here, do this, tweak, change, update, and include your people so you're not doing this all by yourself. You know, then you can you know James could log into your plan and look at it and you know scream at you and tell you to change things and make changes himself in fact right there on your plan you can edit it so you guys can work together and just do stuff it comes together that's so. why you got to select the reviewer option right yeah you yeah you, you've got to be yeah you've got to be the uh, well the reviewer is read only so that's just kind oh of, i know that that was the point <laughs> no, James yeah, you, to change the plan um you got to have access to change the plan <laughs> give the investor the reviewer thing only did anybody did anybody have any last minute uh, questions for Burke before we wrap up? I just wanted to thank Burke for uh, the the um, presentation. It was great, and uh, obviously you put a lot of work into that product. So I'm looking forward to talking to my client about it, and I have other clients who are kind of maybe getting into that uh, position in the future. So. I'll definitely um, uh, discuss it with them. And thank you very much. Cool. You're welcome. I appreciate you guys coming and looking and seeing it. Well, thank you so much, Burke. Um, yeah, it was an excellent presentation, a lot of information. Um, it is. It has been recorded, and I'm going to upload that onto the CBNI's uh, YouTube channel um, so that you guys can have access to that later and review um, what was said, because I know there was just a ton of information that, that you've shared with us, Burke, and it's very much appreciated, but it takes a little bit of time to digest sometimes. Um, it's all real. It's all painful. It's all, you know, it's all that stuff, you know. So uh, we, need a, we need a Murphy. Uh, what'd you, what'd you, what'd you say, uh, Burke? Uh, morphine. <laughs> morphine with it. You're right. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us on this, uh, this special um, edition of uh, How to Pitch Your Business to Investors. Um, and I appreciate you guys and uh, have a wonderful night. Thank Thanks, you. you, guys. Nice to meet you. you. Thank you, Mark. Thanks, James. I appreciate it. Great presentation. Five star. Thanks, guys. Have a good night, you guys. All right. I'm going to Business Power Tools right now. Yeah, man. <laughs>